Okay, what do we do about it? Here's the good news. They're not 10 feet tall. We are. You notice the asterisk. If we play our cards right. As I've indicated, the two tactics I've talked about here to subvert the constitution of knowledge, our knowledge making system, they're not the only two, but they're a powerful pair. Uh, they've served very well, the people who are using them. We can't assume that they automatically go away. We can't assume that social media companies somehow deal with them or universities get over it. These tactics will continue to be used and refined as long as they work. So we got to be smart about this. What do we do? So this is the frustrating part where I say we don't have time to get into the whole laundry list because there's whole chapters in the book. But I'll just give you, you know, a sampling of the kinds of things we're talking about. And the reason it's only a sampling, this is not a silver bullet situation with a list of three things. This is about making many kinds of changes in many types of institutions, in many directions that shore up the constitution of knowledge in the particular ways that were right for those institutions. We've done this before. I can tell you about how modern fact-based journalism was invented. It didn't always exist. It came into existence because in the early part of the 20th century, people saw media that was totally corrupted by extreme partisanship and fake news and began promulgating journalism schools and standards for journalism and societies and journalism awards with within a generation inculcated new norms that created fact-based journalism. That's how you do it, but it's institution specific. We're talking about things like redesigning digital platforms so that they are more amenable to truth. A lot of work has gone into that field, and we can talk about it. Google has, has moved stuff up in the ratings if it's been fact-checked, for example. Um, Twitter, before it was taken over by Elon Musk, was using interstitial, interstitial warnings. Do you want to read this before you retweet it? There's lots of things you can do about the architecture of this software to make it more truth friendly. Unfortunately, we've seen major retreats from the platforms over the past year for a number of reasons on this score. Hardened conventional media, news media have become much better about understanding and resisting manipulation by foreign disinformation sources. Again, unfortunately, after a really good run in 2020, when media did a good job of nipping stuff in the bud and contextualizing it, we're expecting a bigger onslaught in 2024. Anticipate and immunize. Disinformation is like any other type of virus. Um, if you interrupt it early enough, it has a hard time spreading. So you can create safe boundaries. You can use trusted intermediaries to slow this stuff down. There's something called, you've heard of pre-bunking. This is a form of immunization. This prepares people for disinformation that they may hear and says, be on the watch for this. Puts people on their guard a little. The most effective example of this, a textbook case that people in the field say will be studied for years, was used by the Biden administration last year to pre-bunk the propaganda that the administration knew was going to come from Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. That was so effective at preparing the public that it actually deterred the Russians from using a lot of those propaganda techniques. There's a lot of work being done on understanding how to pre-bunk, immunize, ally, and defy. Canceling only works if the employer will fire the person, if the university will investigate the person, if the students ostracize the person, if the cancelers make a fuss about something that you say and everyone else says that's their right, that's the end of the cancel campaign. And in fact, the cancelers move on very quickly to find a softer target. They're not persistent. But that requires that individually, but especially in a group, we stand up to these campaigns. We say, no, not at this university. And here's a big one, depolarize to propagandize. This surprises people. But sometimes the answers to cognitive warfare don't lie in the cognitive realm. They lie in the social realm. Polarization and propagandization are two sides of the same coin. Remember, one of the things that I said is these techniques are designed to divide us and demoralize us. That's what Russia was really doing in 2016. It was seeking to divide the country. It weakens us as a country. So these are rallies. Have any of you seen this photo? This is a white supremacist group called Heart of Texas protesting across the street uh, in, of United Muslims of America who are lined up in front of a mosque. This is a real world confrontation 
that happened in the United States. Does anyone know who organized these rallies? Those rallies were organized from this building the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, Russia, headed at the time by one Yevgeny Prigozhin, the late Yevgeny Prigozhin. That name should ring a bell. That's what they're doing. They are dividing us because the more polarized we become, the more we hate the other side, the more open we are to propaganda and falsehoods about the other side. Those rotten Democrats stole the election. Those rotten Republicans are stealing the courts. And the more propagandized we are, the more divided we are. Propaganda and polarization are two sides of the same coin, and they send us into a downward spiral of just the type that we're in right now. How do we interrupt that? Well, it turns out there's a lot we can do about polarization. Here's an example. I'm a founding member of the board, no longer on the board, but still an evangelist for Braver Angels, a national grassroots depolarizing movement. You can look it up, Braver Angels. Dot org. This is an all-volunteer group. It's in all 50 states, and it sponsors debates and workshops and all kinds of other things that are structured by professionals. Structure is the key. You don't just put people in a room. To help us listen to each other, and people leave those rooms, the most common thing they say is, we're not as divided as we've been led to believe. And that's actually true. People exaggerate their divisions, their substantive divisions, with the other side by a factor of two, but we don't know that and we don't know how to talk to each other. This is a Braver Angels debate. These are being brought to campuses across the country. Um, you can have them here. Maybe you do already. Students are organizing and leading these. These are not competitive debates. These are truth-seeking <coughs> debates where people without special preparation walk in the door and in a structured environment speak their mind. You can speak on both sides of the question if you want. There are lots of efforts like this. Um, join one. Think about one. Look into this. The more we can get over polarization, the less vulnerable we are to propagandization. What can individuals do? This is the most common question. What can I do individually? A lot of what we have to do here involves, um, involves institutional change. It involves acting as a group. Here's one thing individuals can do understand what we're defending. The constitution of knowledge, AKA modern science, journalism, <clears throat> government, and law, have worked so well for so long with regards to truth that it becomes like water to a fish. For a long time, we, even, we forgot these institutions mattered. We forgot that they're important. We just assumed that if a, if a lawyer submitted a brief to a court, it would be fact-based. Of course it would. I mean, how else could it work? Well, what we need to do now is recover the fundamentals that we're defending, and here they are. Three premises underlie both constitutions, and as you'll see, they map very directly onto one another. US Constitution, political freedom, political speech, <coughs> right to petition your government, right to assemble, respect for law. This is the one Abraham Lincoln <coughs> emphasized. It's OK to disagree, but at the end of the day, the law is the law, and that should bring us together. And finally, pluralism. This is Madison. In a country of multiple factions, how do we get along? We tolerate each other. Lots of different factions, and out of their contention and their negotiation will come a dynamic and stable society. Amazingly, it works. Equivalent three in the Constitution of Knowledge, free inquiry, same thing, freedom of speech, freedom to err, to make mistakes without worrying that it's the end of your career and you lose your job if you say one false thing. That's the basis for knowledge. That's the raw material for knowledge, the mistakes that people make. Second, just as important, respect for facts. This is the structure part. You can't lie in your legal briefs. You can't make stuff up in your academic work. You can't be a journalist and be sloppy and put things in that people didn't say and so forth. Those are the rules that keep ourselves honest with regard to truth, and they're difficult rules to follow. People in this academy right here spend years of their lives mastering those rules, but in our own lives, we can defend and respect those rules, and we can ask ourselves before we retweet or repost or whatever they call re-xing something now, before we do that, ask ourselves, have I checked this? Is this really true? 
It may seem funny. Do I know it? If we all do a little more of that, it gets a lot harder to spread the bad shit. And viewpoint diversity, that's the direct equivalent of pluralism. In a room where everyone agrees, no one can learn. Science only advances through disagreement because otherwise biases and assumptions don't get shut. And unfortunately, in many disciplines and many departments in many academic institutions today, there's essentially zero representation of conservative viewpoints, of Christian viewpoints, and so forth. It's not true in every place and every field. But it's become a major problem. We need to address that, and we can in our own lives, our own institutions, by asking if we're in academia, if we're in journalism, if we're in any other field that's truth-seeking, wait a minute. Is there anyone in this room that we haven't heard of? Anyone who's afraid to come forward or worried about coming forward? Um, are there voices that need to be better representative? Have we heard from the Christian, for example? A lot more of that. Two, think globally, yes. These are all big problems. They're huge problems. They're daunting problems. Act locally. So I had this insight a couple of years ago. I was giving a talk like this. And a, a woman raises her hand and she says, I work in the field of uh, China-US international relations. What can I do in my field to advance the Constitution of knowledge? And I sputtered for a moment and said, how would I know? I'm not in your field. But I said, if you sit down with a pad of paper or a laptop for one hour, I bet you can think of three things that you can do in your institutional environment to improve the environment for learning, for knowledge, for facts, for intellectual diversity. It might be something big. It might be something very small, as small as going and supporting that colleague who you see has been ostracized or marginalized because of a viewpoint. If you're a student, it could be as small as sitting next to someone, you know, in the dining room who isn't popular because of something they said. But it can be something big. You can found a chapter of Heterodox Academy. You can bring Braver Angels debates to your school. You can get the Chicago principles enacted right here if they haven't been already. The point is, every single one of us can work to improve our environment for learning and for knowledge, including right here. And I would hope that a handful of you at least, maybe more, will consider that question as you go out the door. Here's number three, be a reality ally. Okay, what's a reality ally? Back here, same experiment, it's been replicated many times. Same experiment, change one parameter. You've got the vision test, you've got the eight people in the room, Seven of the people are actors. This time, six <clears throat> actors say B. One actor says C. What does the experimental subject do if supported by a single other person? Reduces conformity to the almost negligible five to 10%. This is what Solomon Ash reports. As long as the subject had anyone on his side, he was almost invariably independent. But as soon as he found himself alone, the tendency to conform to the majority rose abruptly. So there are two things we learned from this. They're both hard, but one is super hard. The hard one, speak up in that room. Be the reality ally. It's very easy in a classroom situation, for example, to sit there quietly if you hear something that you know is incorrect or that should be challenged. Don't let it go by. Obviously, be polite, be civil, be fact-based, all of those things. Raise your voice. The consequences of speaking out, yes, sometimes they can be socially rough, but the consequences of not speaking out are that the intellectual environment is chilled for everyone else in that room, probably for the rest of that semester. So use your voice. But that's not the really hard thing. Here's the really hard thing. This is Arthur Brooks. Harvard professor, former president of the American Enterprise Institute. He says it better than I will, so I'll just let him say it. We often hear today, in our culture of activism and anger, that real courage is standing up to the people with whom you disagree, sticking it to the people with whom you disagree publicly. That's moral courage. That's wrong. 
That is maybe a perfectly fine thing to do. You should stand up and say the things that you believe. But that's not moral courage. You know what moral courage is? My father taught me this as a kid. Moral courage is standing up for the people with whom you disagree. Standing up to the people with whom you agree on behalf of those with whom you disagree. That's moral courage. That's super hard to do. This is the scientist at the meeting where a presenter is being um, bombarded with negative views who stands up and says, I disagree, but this could be an important paper. Let's give it a hearing. This is the student who stands up when the deplatforming is happening, when those other students, probably a small group, are down there refusing to let her speak or speak. This is the student who stands up and says, let them speak. Let them speak. This is the member of the classroom who knows that there is maybe a conservative or a religious student or whatever it is in the room who's a little bit shy, who finally speaks up, who disagrees with that student, but is encouraging. This is hard, but we can do this. That's the spirit of the Constitution of Knowledge. Now, this is hard, and we will get demoralized, and sometimes it will seem that against the onslaught of social media and Russian-style mass disinformation and cancel campaigns and everything else that's going on, that there's not much we can do. But remember, the enemy here is demoralization. There's a lot we can do. And you will rapidly find allies if you join in this fight for the constitution of knowledge. And here's something else. Remember the stakes. The disinformation campaigners, the cancelers, the censors, the silencers, the people who put Galileo in prison, the people who fired the, S, the San Diego linemen, they cannot discover knowledge. They can cause anarchy. They can cause ungovernability, chaos, demoralization, cynicism. They can win domination for themselves, at least for a period of time. But there's one thing they cannot do and will never be able to do, and that's this. Only constitution of knowledge, the reality-based community, can offer the prospect of the knowledge that can solve the world's problems and bring freedom to more of the oppressed. And I speak to you as a gay American Someone who's now married to a man and began campaigning for marriage almost 30 years ago when it seemed inconceivable that that would ever happen. But here we are, by force of evidence, by force of argument. Let me tell you, your voice is the key. So, thank you for hearing me out. Mm -hmm.